the opportunity. Thank you, Brother Eddie, for just allowing me to stand behind your pulpit. And, um, Sunday night, I had a good time, and it was exciting for me. And we talked about we talked about grace, and we talked about just exactly what grace is. And we went from Old Testament all the way to New Testament. We went through covenants and. Um, you know, it, it was really, really good. I hope I'm going to assume that everybody here was here because I'm not going back over none of that. So if you missed it, I'm sorry. It probably wasn't for you. It was good. But uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to assume that you got all that background, that you know all about grace, that you know all about how powerful it is, how wonderful it is. And we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want to show you tonight what it means. Now that you know all that stuff about grace, that how God can't deny his own name and how his name is wrapped up in his covenant and his covenant is wrapped up in his son and his son died on the cross for you and by putting yourself in Christ, by, by you being born again and, and God looking down at you and seeing nothing but the blood of that new covenant, that you have been wrapped in that grace, you've been freed from your sin, you've been all those things and we, we talked all about that so we talked about, I was thinking as we left Sunday night about, you know, how do you walk in that? Because it's a, it's a hard thing. It's an easy thing, but it's a hard thing because grace is so, I mean, it just don't seem like it should be that free. Now, in my mind, I know it's free. And if I asked all y'all, y'all have been sitting up under enough good preaching to know the right answer to the question, is grace free? Yes, grace is free. Is there anything I can do for my salvation? Absolutely not. Is there anything I can do to make myself more right with God than I am in Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. But we fight a battle walking through life, walking through life and actually walking out this, I don't have to do anything to please God. It's a hard thing. Now, first, when I say I don't have to do anything to please God, that sounds like I'm just offering you a free pass to go and do whatever you want. But if you were here Sunday night, you understood that we were talking about, we were talking about the grace that changes your heart. So I'm, I'm assuming that you realize that the Holy Spirit changes you when you receive this grace. And I'm assuming that you realize that if you're one of the people that say, you know what, grace has got me and praise God, I don't live under the law anymore, and so therefore I can go and do whatever I want, then uh, I, nothing, I, you are reading a letter that is not addressed to you. You have went and opened up somebody else's mail, and it says, Dear Joe, and your name is Frank, and it's not addressed to you, and it's nothing in it is for you. But what, what Peter's talking about here, and these are some verses that we've all heard before. One of Brother Eddie's favorite is about the, the inheritance. You remember Sunday night we talked about how we are grafted into that people, that promise, that covenant God made with, 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 uh, with, with his people. And by being in Jesus Christ, we're a part of his people. Therefore, we have an inheritance that is set aside for his people, all the people that are in him, all the people that are found to be faithful, all the people that are found righteous in Christ's righteousness, all the people that have taken part in that covenant, we, are, we have an inheritance. And, and Peter talks about that inheritance. Uh, we're going to start in verse 13. <clears throat> but just to give you a little background, in 4 through 5, he talks about that inheritance that's incorruptible and it's undefiled and it can't go away and it can't, it can't be taken away and it, can't, it won't fade, it won't, won't corrupt, it won't, it won't corrode, it don't get older. It's there kept for you, reserved for you in heaven. And in verses 6 through 9, he says, because you got this inheritance, you can joy in all your trials. You know, you read it when you get home. You, even though you're going through some things right now, you have joy and you can rejoice in the fact that you have this inheritance that's stored away for you. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. They can take your life. They can take your money. They can take your material things. They can take all your relationships. They can take pretty much everything you own in this world. But they can't take away what you own in, in the name of Christ, which resides in the glory of heaven for you. So that's 6 through 9. In verse 10 through 12, it talks about the Old Testament prophets were pointing. They were longing to see. Get this now. Woo, that's one. I almost went down in steps. <laughs> <clears throat> been hard to preach behind that. The Old Testament prophets were long. Listen, all these people in the Old Testament were longing to see what you've seen. They were longing to know what you know. 
They were longing. They were writing after. That's what it said. Let me just read it real quick. Verse 10 through 12, just to show you what I was saying. It says, it says, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come to you. They were telling you what was coming. They were telling you about this grace. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify what spirit was in those prophets. It was the spirit of Christ which testified in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister these things. They were writing for you. They were writing for me. They were telling us what was to come. They put their faith in what was coming. Jesus and the gospel. It was, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel, unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look at. Do you realize that it's saying everything in creation up until the point that Jesus Christ went and bled and died on the cross was looking forward to what you have. They were looking forward to what you know. They were looking forward to what's in your heart. They were longing, saying, God, please come. God, please save. God, please do these things. And he came. And today, man, it's so easy to take for granted. If, if you were standing before, I don't know, the prophet Isaiah or Elijah, just pick one. I don't know, any of them. And you had what he had been longing for his whole life. This guy, this man of God who trusted in faith and prophesied and gave all these people and warned, warned of judgment to come, told of grace to come, and you have been, you were a partaker in everything he desired his entire life. How do you think he would react to somebody that acts the way that we act? And I'm not talking about just going and doing bad stuff. I'm just talking about not honoring and not just being in awe of what Christ has done for us. You know, you were in awe that first day. Oh, yeah. You were, and I was too. You were, you were struck by the majesty of God and how could he do this for me? But it don't take long. It don't take long to start taking that stuff for granted, doesn't it? It don't take long to start saying, well, I need something deeper. And 99% of the time, when somebody says, and this has been my own experience, so if you can prove me wrong, you, please, please do. If most of the time, I'm going to say 99 just in case. It probably is. <laughs> most of the time when somebody says, well, then I need something deeper. I need something more. I need something, you know, I need something. I need some greater teaching. I need some, some deeper insight. I need to find something that I'm missing they're not spending time with God. They're not spending time in the Word. They're not spending time understanding the gospel. And they're not spending time fellowshipping with the brethren. I guarantee it. So when you, say, when you hear it or when you feel it in your own life, I mean, can, have you felt it before? Like, you know, I just feel like, you know, I'm stalled out in my... One of those things is missing because God is right there like, hello, I'm here. I'm right here. I'm ready to talk to you. I'm ready. If you're in Jesus Christ, can you imagine your son coming to you and saying, you know, I really, really need to talk to you and, you, and you, I ain't got time for you. I ain't got time for you. something serious now. Like if you like, you know, Sophie will come and say, Daddy, I'm hungry. And then she'll come back 10 minutes later and say, Daddy, I'm hungry again. I was like, go on, get out of here. But, you know, like I've got a problem. I, my life is in danger. My life is, uh, I need you. I need you. I need your help. Can you imagine a father, any father, not, not even a, a particularly really good father, would take time to address his child's need if it was a need, a serious need, something bad's going on, I need you. But yet, when something bad goes on with us, what do we do? We don't run to God, we run away from God to try to fix it. Can you see? Look, look at all the empty chairs. That's the deal. It's like, well, I, I, did, I, I messed up. So I, I can't show my face in there now. Ooh, I done messed up. That's completely opposite what the Bible says. You run to God in repentance of faith. That has nothing to do with what I was going to preach about. Anyway, I got stuck in 10 through 12. So I'm going to start in verse 13. So it says, wherefore, and that wherefore means everything I said so far. 
in that, in that chapter. Because you have this inheritance, because you have joy in your trials, knowing that it's all going to be okay one day, you got something stored up for you that can't nobody take away. Because this is what they've been pointing toward all this time. You read that Old Testament, it's all Jesus. It's pointing toward Jesus. It's talking about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And, and because of all that, it says, because of all that, wherefore, he said, now I want you, this is how you walk in it. You gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now I want to take, I want to take them in reverse order, okay? Um, the, main, the main command in that sentence is to hope to the end for the grace. That's the main command. And I, I'll, give you the, I mean, I'll give you the grammar lesson after church if you want it. But the main point of that verse is hope to the end for the grace. That's the command. And so I'm going to take that one first. Then I'm going to go back to gird up your loins of your mind and be, served, and, be, and be sober. All your energy, all your focus, all your, all your purpose, all your hope, all your joy, all your, all your life is bound up in trusting in the hope of the grace that is coming with Christ Jesus when he returns. Now, let me explain what that means. Now, there's, you've got grace. Like, I'm not saying you're waiting. When you were saved, you got grace. Bang. Forgiven for everything. And the, more, the longer I live, the more I, I'm realizing how I, I'm getting grace every day. His mercy is anew every morning. And the more I live, the longer I live, the more I realize how much I need more. I need, I need, you know, how powerful it is that it's still covering me. But there's going to come a day when everything is made right, when sin is destroyed, when there is no more death and there is no more crying, there is no more sin for me to need grace by, and I'll stand before the, the throne of God, and he'll stand up and say, well done, my good and faithful, faithful servant, and he'll wipe away every tear, and every, everything will be gone that is evil and crooked in this world. All the wrong will be made right. And on that day, you will receive a grace that you can't possibly imagine. That'll be the consummation of everything. That'll be the day that you are on the outside what he's already made you to be on the inside. When he looks at you, he sees perfection in Christ if you're born again. If you're not born again, he sees absolutely zero righteousness. There ain't no, well, well, he's doing better than his neighbor. You have 100% or you have zero. There ain't no, there ain't no I'm better than so-and-so. You are perfect in Christ or you are perfectly wicked without him. There's no other option. So when you stand before Christ, it says, Peter's saying right here, he said, now that you know about this inheritance that you have that can't be taken away, that can't be, it can't, moth and rust can't take it away, they can't eat it up, it won't corrode, it won't fade away, doesn't matter how long you live, doesn't matter what you go through, it's going to be there. It's going to be there for you forever. It says, now you take your hope and you focus it on the grace that is coming to you. Do you understand what he's saying? He's saying, look, you are walking through this life and who knows what's going to happen to you? You know, who knows what how your house blow down, you get sick. Eventually, we're all going to get sick. Eventually, we're all going to be in the hospital. I remember telling, you know, I was walking out of the hospital with a guy. He said, man, I hate hospitals. I was like, well, you better get used to it because you're going to end up in one unless you die in a car wreck or something. You know, and so anything that goes on in this life, listen, just battling with my own sin. Sometimes I, just get, I get tired of it. I'm tired of it. I, I'm just I'm ready to be done with it. Just battling over your own, just trying to be holy before God, just trying to live like he'd have you to live. And if you're not battling to be holy before God, then you're not born again. As simple as that. The scripture's going to tell us that here in a minute. But just that struggle, that battle, that fight, those things, there is a light at the end of the tunnel that when you come and you stand, the, the victory for this war Although you're fighting battles every day, the victory for this war has already been won. It's already been, it's already been signed, sealed, and delivered. And when you stand in front of God, you have an inheritance that's perfect. And it's undefiled and it's incorruptible. So he's saying, look, you have to fix your hope on this. You have to set your sights on this. You know how you can tell if you are setting your sights on this? Well, would you have done anything different today? If Jesus would have told you this morning, hey, I'm coming at 3 o'clock. 
I mean, would you have done, would you lived any different? I mean, still gone to work. I'm not saying don't go to work and all that because it don't matter, but you know what I'm saying. Would you lived any differently if you knew that he was coming? We're looking for that hope when everything that is crooked will be made straight. Where everything that is wrong will be made right. Not just out there with the rapists and the murderers, and the, but right in here. All the stuff that's crooked right here will be made straight. All the stuff right here that's crooked, it'll be, it'll be made right. All the stuff that's wrong, it'll be made right. And there won't be no more war, no more. There won't be no battle anymore. There won't be no fight anymore. I'll be, it says, we don't know yet what we'll be, but we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him. And so he's saying, you fix your hope. You fix your hope on this that's coming, this grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, talking about when Christ returns. You know, Jesus brought with him, he brought with him the kingdom when he came, and we saw glimpses of it. We saw, you know, he would come and he would heal, and he gave, he gave his, his people, you know, the, to heal in his name, and, and a man was healed, and a man was, uh, Lazarus was raised from the dead, and, and a blind guy saw, and, and you could see, you could glimpse this kingdom that's coming. That's what it's going to be. But the thing is, Jesus came as a ransom, to ransom himself for you and for me and for sinners all over the world. And those people that he healed, they eventually got sick again. Lazarus was raised from the dead, but Lazarus died again. Those, the guy that was blind, he ended up dying. But when Jesus returns, we're going to be healed never to get sick again. We're going to be raised from the dead never to die again. We're going to be, blinded eyes are going to be open to, be, to remain open forever. And that kingdom is going to be, I want you to understand that I tell the youth this a lot and it seems to help. And it's that this thing about heaven and eternity, it's real. I mean, it's, it's real life. The Bible talks in terms, if I took you to the beginning of Genesis and the end of Revelation, it uses the same terms. You know, the tree of life, the river, crystal river. The, I mean, it uses the, it, the fruit is the healing of the nations, the tree of life. It uses the same thing. Was Adam and Eve real people? Were the garden, was the garden real? You're not one of them people who believes it's all a made-up story, are you? No, it was real. And so eternity is going to be real too. You're going to be you and I'm going to be me and we're going to be walking around in a new city, new Jerusalem. We'll be able to see Jesus face to face. We'll have interaction with each other. We'll talk to each other. We'll have life. It'll be when it says eternal life, it's not fat little angels floating around in the clouds, blowing harps and playing little musical instruments. It's life. Did Adam work in the garden even before the fall? Yes, sir. He was to tend and keep the garden. Guess what that means? You'll work in eternity. It's life. It's not just Oh, you know, some spiritual, it was my, it was my thing with heaven. I, even, even before I was saved, but, you know, I was getting into the Christianity thing and trying to learn stuff, I didn't want to go to heaven. I like being me. I don't want to be some spirit floating around in the clouds somewhere. You know, I like being this, you know, I like being who I am. I want to be. And that's where I was so mistaken because you will be who you are. I'll be Jason forever. I'll know what I know here, I'll know there. The people I know here, I'll know there. You know how I know that? Because Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And you know what? They recognized them that it was Moses and Elijah. And you know what else? Moses and Elijah had a conversation with each other at the Mount of Transfiguration. They were talking about Jesus going to die in Jerusalem. So Moses and Elijah wasn't just spirits floating around in the clouds somewhere. They were still Moses and Elijah. One of the arguments Jesus used against the Pharisees when he said, I am. And they said, you, you wasn't even born when Abraham was living. And he said, he said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Amen. So Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob are still living is what he was saying. Right. So I don't know what I was saying right there, but <laughs> heaven's going to be good. I got excited about heaven. <clears throat> but if you, listen, if I, if I was, if I was Satan... You know, I'm, I'm looking around, and you folks, I probably couldn't get you to rob a bank. I probably couldn't get you to cheat on your husband or cheat on your wife. I probably, you know, if I was Satan, I couldn't get you to shoot up with a needle. or You know, I couldn't get you. It would be a foolish thing for me to even try 
to tempt you with stuff like that. Because even if you fail for it once or twice, you know, you know that that deals, I mean, it's just going to lead to death. It's going to lead to, it's going to destroy everything. But if I was Satan, what I would do, this is what I would do. I was thinking about it today. I would get you so busy. You'd be so busy. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have time from the moment you got up in the morning. I got to get this done. I got to get that done. I've got the kids waiting on me. I've got this over here. I've got that over there. I would get, I would get you running. And by the end of the day, you'd lay down in your bed and you'd say, man, I did good today. I got a lot accomplished. Read my Bible? Well, it's late. I'm tired. My mind is hurting. I would get you where your job would be on your mind after you, when you got home. I would get you where if I was the devil, I'd get you so busy and distracted with life. Or I would get you so so enamored with stuff, you know. If you're a guy, it'd be a fishing boat or a four-wheeler. If you're, if you're a lady, you know what? I don't think it's shopping and stuff. I think it's family. It's family and my kids. I would get you so busy, you wouldn't have time for nothing else. You ain't got no time for no relationship with God. You ain't got time to put your hope on what's coming. You're too busy dealing with the stuff that's going on right here. I'd get you so busy... It would be, and it'd be easy. It'd be easy because you know what? You ain't really doing nothing wrong. You're just going to work and coming home, washing clothes, washing dishes, cutting the grass, you know, wanting to, you know, whatever it is that you do, whatever it is you enjoy doing. I'd get you so busy. You wouldn't have time for no God. You don't have time for nothing else. You barely go to church. And when you did, your mind was on what all you got to do next week. I'd get you so dang busy. I would get your focus off of that hope that's coming. Y'all sure got quiet. Yeah. You okay? Come on. You make a good devil, man. That's what they tell me. Hey, I've been told that before. <laughs> Thank you. The, the hope. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. We ain't got to those yet. Hope to the end means hope completely. You put your hope fully. If you're a, I don't know, if you're a deer hunter or something, you put the sight on that, on the hope of that grace that's coming. No matter what happens in this life, no matter what's going on, my hope is in nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And it's coming. Three things that this hope is not. It's not just wishful thinking. It's not just saying, you know, I say, I hope it, I hope it don't rain today. And I, I'm thinking, well, it could rain or it might not rain. It don't, that's not what this hope is. This hope is a faith. It's, hope and faith is the same thing. The only difference is hope kind of looks to the future. Faith is I believe God. Hope is I believe God's going to do what he said he's going to do over there. I mean, it's some overlap, but you get what I mean. Hope is trusting in God's promise for the future. That's right. Not just saying, oh, I really, 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 really hope it's going to happen. It's like, I trust it. I trust. And the hope is not just encouragement. He's not just saying, oh, come on, buck up, little camper. It's going to be okay. Put your hope in the coming grace. No, it's a command. It says, this is what you're going to do. You're going to put your hope, you're going to focus your faith on what's coming. You're going to focus your faith on things eternal, not things here on the earth. You're going to cite that in, and you're going, to put, you're going to aim for that deal for the entirety of your life. You're not going to be bogged down by any other thing. And when you start to get bogged down, all you have to do is re revamp, refocus that thing, and get back in line. It's like back when they used to sail them old ships, they used to use the stars for for uh, you know navigation and stuff when they didn't have computers and stuff and they would they would line them deals up with the map and they would look through this thing and then they would go the direction they were supposed to be going well you know in the middle of the night everybody's sleeping they got one helmsman and all of a sudden big wind comes blows them off course and now they're off course well when they wake up the next morning what do they do they find that star they line the deal up and they pull it right back to where it's supposed to be and they point it right back where it's supposed to be so I'm not saying that your life's going to be perfect but when you find that target that's the 
target you're aiming at. You put your hope in the grace which is coming to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ, and you aim at that. And that is where your joy is going to come from because nothing can take that joy. doesn't matter what happens to you in this life or what goes on in this life or what they try to do in this life. That will be a reality. The last thing, it's not just a memory like tucked away in the back of your mind. Well, you know, I'm going through this, but I know it's going to be okay. No, it is the focus of my life. It's the only joy, the only thing that consumes me. You ever met like a man? I've met a lot of freaks when they, well, I mean, you know, well, I, pro I've, I probably ought to explain that. You know, everybody's a freak about something. You know, somebody's a freak about baseball. That's just, I'm baseball man. You know what I mean? It's just I live for baseball. And, and somebody else is a freak about old cars. And somebody else is, you know, that's what I mean when I say it. So everybody's got their thing. Well, you know what? We have been born again. We can't get our joy from nowhere else than Jesus Christ and relationship with him. And if you, if you and I attempt to move that sight line and start focusing on something else, you know what's going to happen? It's going to be despair. It's going to be depression. It's going to be, why is this happening to me? What road have I gone down? God, where are you? Why have you left me? And God's going, I'm still right here. When you move that, when you start saying, you know what? The bottom line in my business is more important than my relationship with Christ. My, my relationship with my wife is more important than my relationship with Christ. I'm talking about good things, important things. I'm not talking about just saying, oh, I love my sin more. I'm talking about you put anything in the spot where this is what's fulfilling my joy. You know, I've talked to a lot of of, of ladies who think husband is supposed to be the one who gives me joy in life. Guess what? He's going to fail you every time. I speak from experience. He's going to fail you every time. He's not made. He's not made to fulfill your joy. He can't do it. He can't do it. Watch out now. And vice versa. That's right. The left. She's, she can't give me joy. She can't make me happy. Girl, you know I'm the best thing ever happened to you. <laughs> hey, you want to know something? The one with the microphone always wins. Just in case, just let y'all know. Uh, and it's, e it's easy to do. Especially if I can get you busy. Then it's just, man, it's just a step away to get you I need this to be happy. I need that to be happy. I got to chase after this for a while. I got to chase after the way. I got to chase this to get joy. I got to chase this to have my purpose. My purpose is to find this. My purpose is to get that. It, it, it's not just a step away. Once I get you, once I get you running on that little mouse deal, it's not going to take much to get your focus off of where your hope is supposed to be. And once it gets off, once it gets off, that's when you see bodies start disappearing in here. You start, you start seeing, so where, where did, where did so-and-so go? I ain't seen them in a while. Well, I'm just, I'm, and if one more person tells me I'm tired, that's, look, if you, if you, just don't say that, okay? That's not a good one. Say anything else, you know? It'd be better to come in here and say I had diarrhea. Anyway, okay, anyway, when you, when you, when I can get your focus off of pursuing God as my joy, pursuing relationship with Christ, then all of a sudden, guess what? Service is gone. Attendance is gone. Relationship with God is gone. Uh, time with him is gone. It, it'll just, it'll start falling like dominoes. And one day you'll wake up and you'll say, what happened what to happened? me? Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know how I got here. And the only thing, if you, if I put a straight line, you, you carpenters all know this deal. If I put a straight line down that deal and I go to walk that straight line, if I step off just a little bit right here, it ain't gonna hurt nothing. But by the time I get way out there, it's gonna be. It's going to be, it'll be way, way off. 
And what happens is you take that one little move, your focus off of Jesus Christ and his righteousness, his gospel, and you'll end up so far down the path that you'll be like, I don't, I don't even know how I got here. I don't even know what neighborhood I'm in. You fight to keep your focus. And what I thought about today is it's like a teenager. I heard this story. I don't know how true it is. But I heard this, this teenager inherited $300 million from his parents when they died. But he's 14 years old, and the parents put it in a trust for him that he can't touch it until he's 21. All right, now, that's probably not going to be a good analogy for us in the Christian life, but can you imagine how that boy thought? Oh, I don't care what happened. Look, all I got to do is make it. All I got to do is last till I'm 21, and then everything is, everything's took care of. But what, what, a bad grade? No, I, if I can make it to 21, I'm good. I got $300 million, you know. And can you imagine, that's probably not good in all instances, but what I'm saying is that is our hope, is our focus. We've already won. All we got to do is finish the race. All we've got to do is like we're lined up on the race and they've disqualified everybody else. All I got to do is walk. All I, I mean, can you see me running a 100-yard dash? It'll be, what do you mean no? That was quick. I run a 100-yard dash in like 14 minutes. But I win the race if I'm the only one running. That's right. If everybody else disqualified, I win the race. And so all we have to do is make it. All we have to do is make it. When you get your eyes off of the, my relationship with Christ is the focus and the point and the purpose. And that's what I'm gunning for. It's like that story where Peter got out the boat. Johnny Wayne preached on it not too long ago. What happened? He took his eyes off Jesus and started sinking. Luckily, Peter had, the, Peter had the understanding to say, help me. Because most of the time, I see people start sinking, they just go right on to the bottom. Because right. right. they won't cry out and say, help me. They won't come back and realign their focus to the grace of God that we Maybe. talked about last Sunday. So let me, let me just show you a couple other things and then we'll go. Um, keeping your focus on the grace that is coming, on the kingdom that is coming, on the inheritance that you have, on the gospel itself. It's not like flipping a light switch. It's not like I'm coming up and saying, you know, okay, do it. And you say, okay, I'm going to do it, and that's done. It's, it's a fight every day. You're going to fight. That's why it says, gird up the loins of your mind. That's why it says, be sober. And this is what you've got to do. You know what girding up your loins means? It means, you know, it's an Old Testament you know, saying they, they wore these big long robes, you know, and when they went into battle or they had to go to work or they did something, they took that robe and they would wrap it around and then they tuck it in so their legs were free. You know, now, now I can run, now I can fight, now I can do what I need to do. Hey, God told the uh, Israelites when they eat the Passover in, in Egypt, when the, the angel of death came over, he says, when you eat the Passover, you have that deal done. You have your loins girded up and ready to go because when I say move, we're going to move. So what he's doing is like saying, you have your, this is not some, you know what I ought to think about. This is have your mind ready for battle. Have your mind ready to go. This is not, this is not something that, you know, if you, if you, uh, the, the way we treat the Christian life is the wrong way. We treat it like I'm on a beach somewhere relaxing and somebody's putting grapes in my mouth and it's all good and I don't have to worry about nothing. The reality is that you just got dropped down into Baghdad. And you, you got a big target on your forehead now that you're in Jesus Christ. And you got enemies that are shooting at you. And you better be alert. Can you imagine some dude in a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops dropped off in Baghdad just strolling around whistling a national anthem or something? He wouldn't last 10 minutes. But that's how we live the Christian life. We just wandering around. We wandering around doing nothing, not worrying about nothing. When all around us we got enemies that are shooting at us, we got the world, we got the flesh, you've got your own flesh inside of you that's trying to get you away from the spirit that resides inside of you. How could you not walk around at war? How could you not be at war? I read this book one time about this sniper guy, and he was in Vietnam, and, and, and he just talked about how your senses are, are heightened when you're, you know, you're, you're hiding in the woods and people are walking by and you're waiting on your target and it's like you can hear, you know, he was, you can hear crickets 
and branches. You know, he said you could just, it was like everything was focused in and, and it was just like you were so alert, so aware, so, and I guess it had to do with being afraid, being fearful, being understanding that this is important, that these, you know, they're going to try to kill me and I've got to defend myself. I've got to do my job. I've got to be here. That's how we live the Christian life. We live it understanding that I have enemies and every day they're going to try to get me. They're going to try to get me to do things that I would not normally do. And the, the most important thing they'll try to get you to do is just be, uh, it don't matter today. That's the killer. It's not, hey, go cheat on your husband. Hey, go cheat on your wife. It's, I'm tired. It don't matter today. It's not going to make a big deal. Don't make a big deal out of it. You know, we all just have stuff that we got to do. We, you know, it's not a big deal. I'll get it done next week. It says, you gird up the loins of your mind. Verse 14 through 16, let me hurry up. It says, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. You know what holy means? Holy means you have set yourself apart for service to God for relationship with God. You know, the things in the tabernacle, they had common vessels and they had holy vessels. And you couldn't use holy vessels for anything other than sacrifice to God, for a ritual to God. You couldn't use the fork. You couldn't use the, the pot, the bowl. If it was holy set apart for God, you couldn't use it just to eat out of it. You couldn't use it to, you know, whatever. I'm trying to think of something you could do, but... It was set apart, set aside, and it was used only for God. So what we're talking about here is not, it's not about following a bunch of rules and saying, you know what, I've got to do X, Y, and Z, and I know what, I shouldn't do this, and I shouldn't do that, and I should stop doing this, and I should stop doing that. If you are if you're set yourself apart for God, use only for Him, all that stuff will happen by itself. If you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, it's all taken care of. That's all you got to do. Is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or attempt it, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that sums up the whole law. That's what Jesus said. So it says, it says you, you set yourself apart. And if you attempt, I, I can tell you this from experience too. If you attempt, let's see what time it is. I've probably been rambling too long. If you attempt to obey God apart from his spirit, his help, his moving in you, just out of duty, you know, I'm a Christian, so that means i got to do this. You'll fail every time because you're not strong, weak. Your flesh is weak. Now, the spirit inside of you is strong. And if you can, do, you can do it in his power. You can do it in his strength. You can do it with his might. You can be strong in, in his might. But we do that with our focus on the gospel as obedient children. You see what it said? It said, not as servants, not as slaves, not as workers, as obedient children children that love their father an obedient child is obedient because he loves his father or he's scared to get a whooping but when you let me put it this way let's say that I love chocolate. I know it's a stretch, but let's just say that. <laughs> and chocolate's my thing, and I really love it. I'm not, I'm not talking about, oh, I love chocolate, but I really love chocolate, right? And so all of a sudden, God comes to me, and he says, this is just an example now. I'm just giving you a, you, my, mine's chocolate, yours could be whatever. God comes to me and says, thou shalt not eat any more chocolate. And I say, okay, you know, I'm yours. I'm set apart. I'm holy. I love you. I want to do for you. I you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you. But there's still something inside of me that loves chocolate, right? And so I say, I don't, I don't, I do good for a while, but then after a while, you know, it's like I have a bad day and everything's going, you know, I deserve some chocolate. I deserve a treat. I deserve to have some chocolate. And therefore, you know, okay, maybe I won't do it this time, but then life goes on and something bad happens and, you know, I'm just having a horrible day and everybody's on me and I just can't, you know, whatever. You compound the stress however you want it. What happens? That love for chocolate still in there. It's going to come out. But now think of it this way. 
I go to the doctor. I'm not feeling good. I go to the doctor, and the doctor says, Jason, you put another piece of chocolate in your mouth, you're going to die. You think it would be hard for me to quit chocolate? Why? Because you do what you love. I love my life a whole lot more than I love chocolate. But in the first sense, I didn't love God more than I love chocolate. I was just trying to obey the rules. You see what I mean? And so when you, when, you, when you set out just to obey the rules and you're not focused on the grace that's coming, the relationship you have with God, the gospel that you have with God, you're, you're bound to failure. Something inside of you has got to change. Something inside your love has got to change. If you're busy running the rat race, going around, don't have no time to deepen your relationship with God, don't know, have no time to grow in Him, don't have no time just to sit quietly and listen to Him, don't have any time to read his word. Don't have any time to pray. Don't have any time to fellowship with his saints. And I got to tell you, that's a huge one. You can't grow in patience sitting in the house by yourself. You, that's fruit of the Spirit, you know, patience. You can't grow in long-suffering sitting in the house by yourself. You can't grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. You can't grow in none of them sitting around by yourself. And so, you want to cut off the head of your Christian growth? Just keep your rear end at home on Sunday. That'll do it. That'll be the quickest way to do it. Verse 17 says, I love this, man. Peter is like, it seems like Peter is saying it's amazing to him that after all God's done, we treat him like... When I say treat him, I, we just don't live in fear of God, the fear of God. You know, when I say that, I'm, I'm not talking about just cowering in the corner. I'm talking about, I mean, can you imagine, like, the one who made the sun, the one who made all this power, all this majesty, and we'd be bopping around here like we're our own, I got my own life to live. It says... Verse 17, and if you call on the Father, what it's saying right there is if you call this God Father, said, who without respect of persons judges according to every man's work. That's, in that instance right there, that's not a good thing. What he's saying is he's going to judge everybody. If he judges you by your work, you're in trouble. It says, if you call this judge Father, if you call this one who's going to judge every man, you included, if you call him Father, he said, then you pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. Say, so you don't live here. This is not your home. This, you're just traveling through. If you, now, if you call this judge father, if he is your father, and as obedient children, you're holy, setting yourself apart for him, you can't take this thing lightly. You can't take this grace of God lightly. You can't go bebopping around here thinking, thinking, you know, I got it going on because I said a prayer, because I did a thing. You better make sure. You better pass your time sojourning in fear, understanding that God is holy and God's justice is perfect and his wrath is great and mighty. And this is why you pass in fear. It says, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, this is why you pass your sojourning in fear from your vain conversation received by your tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ Amen. as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times who by him do believe in God. You believe in God by him that raised him from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. That's where your hope is. That's where your purpose. That's, you know, if somebody says, well, he's a car freak or he's a baseball freak, God's people should be Jesus freaks. Amen. Amen. And if they're not Jesus freaks, <laughs> something's bad wrong. Something's bad wrong. And you might find yourself today, you might find yourself in a place where, you know what, I've, I've just, I've lost something. 
I don't serve anymore. I mean, I'm not talking about just picking up chairs and vacuuming the floor. I'm talking about serving God. I don't serve God anymore. I don't, I don't have any inclination to develop my relationship with God anymore. I don't have any, I don't have any time to just sit in silence and pray anymore. And so what that does is it lets garbage into the water stream of your life. And then pretty soon it just becomes poisonous. And you say, what happened? What happened to me? I don't understand why I'm like this. And the reality is you've took your eyes off of Christ. You've moved your life instead of heading toward Christ and His righteousness and His gospel and His kingdom and the grace coming to you, you've moved it towards something else. I've got to get my family straight. I've got to get my house fixed. I've got to get my new boat. I've got to get a new truck. I've got to get my... All those things are not sinful. They're good things. You need to get your house fixed. You need to get your family straight. But they are not the hub around which your life turns. If Jesus is not the hub of that of that wheel that's your life, nothing else is going to be right. And you'll go and you'll try to fix this and you'll try to fix that and you'll try to fix this and this. And, and as soon as it's like spinning them plates on those, those sticks. I don't know if you've seen them guys. They'll spin this one a while and they'll spin that one a while and they got to keep going back. And as soon as I get this one going and I think they're all going, this one's stopping. i got to run back and get it again and then run back and get it again and run back over here. And it's just life is... All the time. I'm just spinning plates. And, and every, time, every time I drop one and it breaks on the ground, I feel like a failure. I've done messed everything up. And so I try again. I'm spinning, 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 spinning. When the reality is all I have to do is set that sight of my life on the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added. You understand? Everybody got me? I don't know if that was for anybody, but I know that this week especially, it, it was definitely for me. It was definitely for me. I want you all, not just, I want you all to make heaven. But man, there's so much to enjoying the ride there. You know what I mean? Christ desires for us to have our joy in him. And he's got it all right there. And if we would just find our joy in him, I know it's there. And I know it's, you've got it. If we would just find it there, everything else would just take care of itself. Would you go through bad stuff? Sure, sure. I mean, you're going to go through, in this life, you're going to have trouble. But if you focus that scope on the gospel, and how it's growing me, growing me in my relationship with God. A lot of your worries will be gone. Some of y'all are worried about your kids. But you're too busy to introduce them to God. Some of y'all are worried about your job, but you're too busy. Some of you are worried about different things in your life, this or that. It could be anything. I mean, I got things I'm worried about right now. I mean, we all got things. But when you get too busy, when you get too busy trying to fix the stuff rather than grow your relationship with God, you've taken that first step that Peter took down into the water because he took his eyes off Jesus. That's all I got. You want to say something? Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I, I thank you. And I praise you for your gospel. I praise you for your grace. I praise you for the, the understanding that we have everything in you. If we would just point ourselves toward you, focus on you, God, that you would provide us with such joy, such, such peace. You would take care of all the things that we're calling out upon your name for. You said that if we'd ask in your name that you would give it. Father, we just pray that you would come into this place and that you would convict our hearts and that you would that you would use what we've heard use this passage in Peter God to to show us where we where we need you